Good evening, everyone. Good evening. This evening, before we start, I want to show you all something that I came across that uh, was pretty inspirational. I don't know if you all have seen it. Now, I'm going to set it up really quick, Tim, before you play. Um, there's this viral video that uh, been circulating on the web that happened last, last Friday. Down in Austin, Texas, there was this high school football team that had a football game. And they were playing against, I guess, some rival team. And this team was beating them by like two touchdowns at halftime. And so you know how teams do when they're down. They go down, go into the locker room, and they try to get inspired. The coach tries to inspire them. But anyway, this game turned around in the second half. And so this team came back, and they actually, I believe, went into overtime. And they won by like one point, this high school football game. And so after the game, the local TV station, they, as they always do, they go out and they cover the game and they interview this young man. Do you have a tip? They interview this young man. I don't know how many of you have seen this. Hey, Joaquin, I'm out here with the Paul watch Chester, it. wide receiver for the Patriots. You guys have one heck of a game tonight. Uh, how'd it go? I mean, it was going a little back and forth. You guys knew it was going to be a tough dog fight out there, and it was. So what were you guys able to do to come back and win this thing? All right, well, at first we started slow. We started real slow. And, you know, that's all right. That's okay because sometimes in life you're going to start slow. That's okay. We, we, we told ourselves, hey, we're going to start slow. We're going to keep going fast. We're going to start slow, but we're always, always going to finish fast. No matter what the score was, we're going to finish hard. We're going to finish fast. Yeah, they had us the first half. I'm not going to lie. They had us. We weren't defeated, but they had us. But it took guts. It took an attitude. That's all it takes. That's all it takes to be successful is an attitude. And that's what our coach told us. He said, he said, hey, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. You're going to go out there. You're going to battle. You're going to fight. You're going to do it for one. You're going to do it for one another. Do it for each other. You're going to do it for yourself. You're going to do it for us. And you're going to come out with this win. And we believe that. We truly did. And it's, it's an awesome feeling. It's an awesome feeling when you truly believe that you're going to be successful. Regardless of the situation, regardless of the scoreboard, you're going to be successful because you put in all the time, all the effort, all the hard work and you know that it's going to pay off and if it doesn't pay off you continue to give God the glory if you still lose the game you continue to get it to us back and that and that's what we realized regard when I lose we realized that we were gonna be all right and it's gonna be okay we're gonna we're gonna keep smiling it was awesome awesome well it's always got a smile on his face talk about attitude this guy's got attitude if you guys can't tell uh, we met earlier this week and uh, this was the enthusiasm I saw it Yes, ma'am. Hey, you can do anything you put your mind to. Never give up on your dreams. Keep smiling. No matter what you're going through, if you fall down, just get up. If you can't get up, your friends are there to help you up. Your mama's there. Your daddy's there. God's there. Hey, I'm there to help you up. You're there. It's going to be all right. Keep smiling. Man, along with all the football highlights you guys have gotten tonight, some motivational speaking courtesy of Paul Sester. Man, great game tonight, right, buddy. So, yes, they're happy for you guys. Uh, this guy with one touchdown and a whole lot of sass coming out here. For the East View Patriots. All right, guys, we'll send it back to you. All right, all right. How about that? This high school student. This is recent. They said, man, in football, you, you sure you got to call him right? That brother's a preacher. Yeah, really. <laughs> Motivational speaker or something. Motivational speaker. <laughs> but I just wanted to show that for the young people to see because, you know, there are young people that are unashamed. Many of us go to school, and for some reason, we see people who who are, are living a certain way, and we are tempted to try to join them in their lifestyle. Knowing what we know here at church and in the faith, we try to suppress it when we're at school. But this was just a perfect example of someone who not only at his school, but on, on TV, was unashamed to speak about God and to speak positive and actually show what he believed in. Amen? Amen. So I just want to encourage young people. I thought that was inspiring. So I want to show that before we got into today's message. If you would, let us uh, bow our heads for another word of prayer. <laughs> Father, we ask that you would at this time calm our hearts and our minds. For we know that there are times when you speak to us in a still, small voice. And so, Father, whatever it is that's going on in our minds that may be distracting us, we pray that you remove it. Bring peace and quiet within us so that you may speak and so that we won't leave here the same way that we came. We thank you, dear Father, for hearing that message of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
you would turn with me in your Bibles to our scripture this evening, it was John chapter 5. Turn with me in your Bibles. I'm going to put it on the screen. Uh, however, I don't want you to be afraid to, to use your analog Bible, as I've heard people call it. A physical Bible that you can touch and feel and actually hear when the pages are turning. I'm going to put it on the screen, but if you have your Bible, please join with me. Uh, I see some people are just depending on the screen. I might have to just <laughs> test y'all one day and put a false scripture up there. Y'all might be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're going to read it together. Is that all right? John chapter 5. And we're going to read together verses 1 through 9. And I guess we'll read together this version I have on the screen. Okay, let's read together. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. And whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity for thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Say it unto me. The impotent man answered and said, For while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 You know, there's one thing that is true that I found out in life, and that is, there is always something more to want. There's always something else that you want more. Growing up as a kid, there was always a new toy that I saw on TV that I wanted. I would get something maybe around Christmas or for my birthday, and it would be fun for just a little while, but then after a few weeks, Aliana, I would get tired of the toy, and then I would want a new toy. Like, I remember there was a time where I went to the store, I think it was Toys R Us with my mom, and I saw a lot of toys that I wanted, but then this particular trip, I came across a toy that I just knew was the last toy I ever wanted. <laughs> See, I saw in that store what I thought was some money. Sure, I wanted the nice little car, sure, I wanted the nice little action figure, but I saw the money, and so I went to my mom and said, Mom, can you please buy me this toy? I promise you, I will never ask you for another toy ever again. What toy do you want? And why not? I want this money. Because I looked at it, and it looked exactly like real money. I kid you not. It had like Thomas Jefferson on there, it turned slightly to the side, right? It had like the, the numbers in the corner, and it looked exactly like real money. And so I promised my mom, mom, there is nothing else I will ever ask you for after you get me this toy. Because little did she know, I was just going to get the toy money, then I was going to use that money to buy whatever other toys I want. I just, I had it all figured out. She wouldn't have to buy me that else because then I could buy whatever else I wanted with this toy. So she said, all right, then, I guess you, you really want some play money. You can do it as at home when I see the paper, but I'll buy you the toy. So I got the toy. I'm feeling like I made it. I'm balling now. Go home with my pack of play money. Hey, dinner's on me, y'all. What do y'all want to eat? This is the place. I got it. I get home, open up. My, my new toy, my, my play money, and I pick it up, and I, and I look at it, and I go, uh-huh. <laughs> Flip the money over, and on the back of the money, it was just a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> like, I, I was tripping because in the store, the money looked very real. But when I got it, I flipped it over, it was like just copy paper. And not only that, I said, uh, uh, Mom, uh, this, this your, let me see a dollar bill real quick. I, I just want to see it compared. It was actually like half the size.
size of a real dollar bill. And I had a rude awakening then that this thing, this toy that I thought was the last thing I'll ever need, right, was going to solve all my problems, was going to enable me to buy whatever I wanted, wasn't quite what I thought it was. I wanted more. And the truth of the matter, if we ask ourselves, if we take a look at ourselves, there are times when we realize that we want something, and then when we get it, we want something else. I mean, life is almost like that. I remember when I was like your age. I, I, was, I was young and I was always like, oh man, I'm always the next age. So I'm seven, but I just go around like, man, I can't wait till I'm eight. That's right. When I'm eight, I'm going to be able to say, ah, oh, I'm going to primary class, you know. I'm at eight, I'm like, oh man, I can't wait till I'm actually uh, 10. I can be double digits, you know. Pre-teen, Roger, I'm like, yo, I want to be a teenager, man. I'm tired of hanging out with these little kids. Oh, come I turned 13, RJ, and I'm like, man, I can't drive. So what I really need to do is turn 15 or 16 so I get my license. So I'm like, yeah, I get my license, get my license, and I realize, man, you gotta be 18 to actually do stuff. Mm -hmm. Turn 18, and then I realize, man, I can do stuff, but I can't rent a car. I gotta pay extra because I need to be 25. Mm -hmm. So I can't wait to go to college. I can move out of the house. I can do whatever I want. I'm in college, and I'm in college, and guess what I want to do when I was in college? I wanted to graduate, I wanted to leave. I was tired, right? I wanted to go out, I was like, no, I'm tired of this. I, there's something else I want to do. And then you know how the story goes. You graduate from college, then you're like, man, you know, lonely. I'm so lonely. And then many of you said, man, I just need somebody to marry me. We can start a family together. And then we get married. We thought that that person was everything that we needed, but we still feel like something's missing. For many of you, you thought it was kids, so you say, oh, let's have kids. Let's have another one. Oh, let's have another one. And then what do you say, oh, Lord, it's, man, I can't make these kids grow up. <laughs> and move out of my house. Yes. So I can have my stuff back. And so what I'm saying to you is that we find ourselves in this perpetual longing for something to somehow complete us. That's right. Right? There is something more that we need, yeah. whether it's physical. Many of us are, are, are dealing with this a few issues, right? There are times where, like, man, man I, my finger hurts. And I remember this movie. It was like, ah, my finger or something. And the guy was like, oh, your finger hurts? I know how to fix that. And then he, like, broke his leg or something. <laughs> you still feel your finger? No, I feel my leg. No, I fixed it. Piece of cake. So sometimes we have physical things that we're like, man, I mean, this thing, this thing, God, really can't, can you fix this? Yeah. Well, they're emotional issues, they're, they're pains that we go through, like, Lord, Lord, please fix this thing so I can move on to a, to a better place. Mm -hmm. Maybe one another degree, maybe it's intellectually, maybe it's socially, or maybe it's spiritually. Mm -hmm. As we talked about last night, many times we can find ourselves doing things over and over again mm -hmm. that we don't quite understand. Lord, please fix this. Mm -hmm. I need something. Well, the Bible tells us about the story where Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem and he came to this place, this pool called Bethesda, right? Bethesda was this pool where at the time, everyone who was impotent, as the scripture says, which means those who lacked strength, those who are, were, were without, those who were incomplete, if you will, were there trying to be made well. And so they said, they knew, they believed at this time that when the water was stirred, when the angel touched the water, the first person jumping there would get that thing that they've been waiting for all their lives. Mm -hmm. Here you have a picture of Bethesda. You know, there was a time where, where they were, there was, there were skeptics saying that this pool didn't really exist. It was just a myth in the Bible. However, I, I, I like to inform you that in 1963, archaeologists recovered, they actually dug up the pool of Bethesda. That's it right there in the upper left-hand corner. And in the bottom right hand corner is actually where they tried to rebuild it and show you what the pool looked like. Mm -hmm. So Jesus came to this pool. All around this pool were people that were incomplete. Mm -hmm. People that were lacking. People that needed to be made whole. Mm -hmm. Now, I gave you all a little clue last night that uh, being, I guess, an engineering major, I like to kind of draw analogies with things that I'm familiar with. And so tonight I'm just going to show you a little bit of what I've 
been blessed to be able to see. I'm so thankful for of how God and salvation and Christ in the Bible correlates in numbers. Mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the screen, I have what is called a number line. What is it? Number. All right, some of you all saw that. Who saw this before? Young people, have you seen this before? All right, all right. So over here on this number line, over on the purple side, on the right side, we have positive numbers. What kind of numbers? Positive, positive numbers, all right? And so on the positive side, if you continue to count, eventually we know that numbers technically or theoretically never end. And so you go to a place known as infinity, positive infinity. All right, so for sake of this analogy, positive infinity represents righteousness, holiness, truth, heaven. Amen? Amen? Positive infinity. So if on the right side we have positive infinity, on the left side we have negative what? Infinity. Negative infinity. And so if positive infinity represents truth, righteousness, holiness, and heaven, what does negative infinity represent? Death. Yeah. Everything the opposite of that, right? Mm -hmm. But here's something. I want you guys to be able to kind of wrap your minds around this. Zero, zero represents Jesus. Jesus came to bridge the gap in the lane between us who originated, who are always, who were at one point on this negative side, giving us an opportunity to move into the positive side. Who says amen to that? Amen. Jesus represents zero. Let me show you how in scripture Jesus represents zero. If you look at math, you would know that in Matthew 25, if you saw the scripture, it says that Jesus was going to come back and he was going to come and sit on my olives and he was going to divide the sheep and the what? Goat. The goats. Mm -hmm. And just to go back real quick, it said that the sheep were going to be on his right side. Positive. Mm -hmm. And the goats were going to be on his what side? Left side. Jesus is zero. But if you look at some mathematical operations, you would know that if you subtracted a number from zero, that positive number would then become negative. Removing yourself from Christ would be removing yourself from truth, righteousness, and salvation. Zero minus a number equals negative. So you move from a sheep to a what? However, praise be to God, if you came to Christ and the addition took place where Christ was embraced by you and accepted into your heart, you would move from being a goat to being a sheep. That's from a right. negative to a what? Right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But there are other operations. We got add, subtract. What if we got Jamal? What other operations do we have in Matt? What? We have division. Thank you. Thank you. If you try to divide a number into Christ, meaning you can write it where Christ is up top and the number is on the bottom, putting Christ above you, where he belongs, amen. amen, you still end up with what? Christ. With Christ, amen. Now who can tell me what would happen if you tried to divide zero into a number or put you yourself above Christ? What's the answer? One divided by zero. Who knows that? What is it? Zero. It's not zero. Oh, it's, um, it's not one. Did you all know mathematically that it's impossible? It's impossible. Yeah. Right. The answer is literally undefined. Or in other words, the answer does not exist. Do we know somebody that tried to put themselves above God? No. That scripture right there, Isaiah 14, tells us that Satan tried to lift himself up above God, above the Most High. Right? And then that scripture, if you read it, it says that therefore you will be cast down into Sheol, into the grave. You will be destroyed. Because that does not exist. Who says amen to that? Amen. So let's keep Christ in his proper perspective. So looking back at the number line, we know that Christ is zero, and you and me, all of us, are somewhere on this number line. Mm -hmm. But as we know with salvation, our value, whether negative or positive, our ultimate absolute value in terms of salvation depends on where we stand in relationship to Jesus Christ. Where that number is in relationship to the zero, if it's on the right side, then it's a positive number. If it's on the left side, it's a negative number. And so your salvation, your righteousness, your truth, it depends on where you stand in relationship 
to Christ. Isn't that good? Amen. Isn't it beautiful how you see, see salvation and everything? The gospel and everything? Amen. Amen. All right, all right. Moving on, moving on. Amen. So let's look at this scripture. We see that Jesus came to Jerusalem during a time that was called the Feast of the Jews. The Feast of the Jews. And so at this time, there was, there was a festival. There were many feasts of the Jews that were celebrated, or they celebrated as a part of their heritage. But many scholars believe that this feast was likely the Passover. The Passover was a feast that they did to commemorate when they were freed from Egypt. Where at the time they had to slay a lamb and they had to put the blood on the doorposts. And that lamb in the past represented Jesus. Who did the lamb represent? Jesus. So if this feast was the Passover, they were coming to Jerusalem, Jesus himself, they were coming to celebrate, to commemorate Jesus, Christ, the true Passover lamb. So this is the context. So they were coming to celebrate Jesus, and they were coming to a place called Bethesda. Now Bethesda, as the scripture tells us, is known in the Hebrew tongue to mean house of what? Mercy. Or in other translations, say house of grace. House of grace. So they were coming to Jerusalem to celebrate Jesus to this house of grace and mercy. And which day was it? The Sabbath day. But check, check out the context. They were coming to celebrate Jesus in the house of mercy, house of grace, on the Sabbath day. But there were people among them that were broken. Don't you know that we can come to celebrate Jesus in this house of mercy, this church, even on the Sabbath day, and there are people among us that are broken. See, young people, sometimes we, we, we can make the mistake of assuming that once we get baptized, everything's going to be good. I'm going to join the church. Everyone's going to love me, and I'm not going to have to deal with any more brokenness. Everybody's whole. I'll tell you one of the things that you see when you grow up in the church is that not everyone, as he was in his state of complexity, of irrationality, his state of being incomplete for 38 years. And so Jesus asked him the question that he's asking us tonight. He says, sir, do you want to be what? Do you want to be whole? Do you want to be whole? Are you tired of being imaginary? Do you want to be whole? But the guy said something to Jesus. What did he say? Yeah. Sir. Go ahead and read it. What did he say? Sir, I have no man with the water to look at you. Now I have to admit to you all, when I read this, as a person reading the scripture, I see Jesus say, do you want to be made whole? Did he answer Jesus' question? No. That's a yes or no question, isn't it? Yes. Do you want to be made whole? But sometimes we say, man, but I, I, don't, I don't have a boyfriend. I don't have a girlfriend. I mean, yeah, but I really need some new shoes. If I get some new shoes, then, then, trust me, then I'll be made whole. I just need this thing to be worked out between me and, and my boss. And if he just give me that little raise, then, then, Christ, then, then, I'll be whole. Yes, I, I hear you. You're asking me, do I want to be made whole? And so here it is. If I just get that fake money. You do know that our money is, is fake in the currency of God, right? You know he doesn't need our money to do what he needs to do for us, right? But how often do we include that in our response when he asks us, do we want to be made whole? And so the guy just basically ignores Jesus and responds in a way that shows that he thinks that his wholeness is not in the person that's asking him. He says, yeah, I want to be made whole, but how am I going to be made whole if this is the case? Here is the source of completeness, the source of life, the source of all healing, the one who is able to make him whole there on the spot. And instead of responding to him 
with the loud resounding yes. He looks over here and says, Lord, I don't have a man to help me get in the pool. In other words, you don't have what I need. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that there is nothing in this world that can complete us. Amen. There is nothing in this world that can complete us. And this is needed, this is, this is necessary to be said to you all this morning. All of my young people and, 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 and young at heart people, we need to know this because so often we fall into the trap of the world that doesn't, that isn't designed to complete us, but rather this world is oftentimes designed to show us how incomplete we are. Yes. Amen. You turn on TV and you see, man, you would be complete if only yeah. you get you some new Burger King chicken fries. Yeah. <laughs> you would be complete if you only get you a Ford truck. Right. You would be complete if you get the latest Honey Nut Cheerios with the toy in the bag in the box. This world, this advertisement, you look at the marketing industry, it's designed to show you that, look, you're incomplete, but I got just the right thing for you. That's right. But we need to remember that what? Nothing in this world can complete us. And so Jesus knows this. He asks you, he says, do you want to be made whole if for some reason we're diverted to other things? We're diverted to the acceptance of our friends. We're diverted to, 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 to maybe we just need just, just a better environment, a church with better music. Just more young people, whatever the case may be, somebody my age to relate. Yes, those things are good, but that's not what makes us whole. So Jesus knew that. He said to the man, "Rise." He just he he, he once again ignored what the man said, just like the man ignored him. He still extended, despite this his his misdirection. He said, "Rise, take up thy bed, and do what?" Now notice something. Notice something. There are numbers, as I said before, between whole numbers, right? There is one, and if we were to do decimal points, the number after one could be 1.1, 1 .1, right? But then, guess what? There's a number between 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2. That number could be 1.12 or 1.11 before 1.1 becomes 1.12. Are you guys following me? You see that there? There's another decimal place that can make it take another few steps before you get to the next one. There's a number between 1.12 and 1.13. That number could be 1.23. I can add another decimal place. And there's another number before I get to that next number. I can actually just add another decimal place and still have not gotten to the next number. And so at this point, realizing that once again, theoretically, we can infinitely add numbers after the decimal point. So one point, and take forever, an infinite amount of time before we get to two, we realize that not only do we have a number line that goes to positive infinity, right, into negative infinity, but there is literally infinity inside of the whole number. There's infinity between each number. Sure. And that's not by any accident. There is a scripture, as you see on the board, I'm going to read for you, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. You know, Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. Solomon was a very wise man. He was able to search out wisdom. He, he was able to just determine things and see things much deeper than the common man would see them. And so he, read, he, he wrote this in Ecclesiastes Chapter 3, verse 11, he said, He has made everything beautiful in his what? Uh -huh. Also, he has put what? Eternity in their where? Uh -huh. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning. He has put what in our hearts? Eternity. I can't hear you. He's put what in our hearts? Eternity. Eternity. So there is, brothers and sisters, an infinite void inside of us. Eternity. There's a void that is naturally placed in you from birth that you have. So, on one hand, you can't really blame yourself for wanting something more. Mm -hmm. 
You guys with me? I said that we are going to want something more. And what the next thing? And I realized, realized that the next thing is, is not good enough. And I'm going to want something more. Because inside of me, I have an eternity of want. An eternity of desire. There is an infinite void inside of me. You guys with me? So let me show you something. I cut this out just like a few minutes ago. This is just something I want to do to be able to illustrate. So here we are. We're created, right? And Solomon said he put eternity in our hearts. Right? This paper represents our hearts. You guys see this hole? Now this is not an eternal size hole. All right? It's not. This is not eternity. But let's imagine that this boy is as big as eternity. Right? This is the infinite void. Now, if I was born with this hole in my heart, this desire, this, this something I want more, right? And I try to fill it maybe with uh, some new toys. Does that fill the void? No. Because toys isn't big enough to fill this hole, right? If I had this, oh, maybe I just need to become a teenager so I can drive. And so I, I try to fill it with maybe just some sort of new responsibility and growth. Does that fill the void? No. Ask you, does this fit the void? No. no. No? All right, all right. So what should I use? Should I use this? Uh, can I fill it with this? No, no. Okay, all right, all right. What about, I know. I know, new outfit. Can I fill it with a new outfit? No. Uh, uh, uh. All right. So I have this boy, and then I have something that is the same size as the boy. With this, which is what I actually did, cut out this, this sheet of paper. Would this be big enough to fill this hole? Mm. Right, right, because I cut it out of paper. In other words, I'm only able to fill this hole with something that is large enough to inhabit. That's right. We are created with an eternal, infinite void, and it can only be filled with something large enough to fill and inhabit eternity. Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 15, 57, verse 15. It says, For thus says the high and lofty one who what? Yeah. Inhabits eternity. All right. We have a void that is eternal. And unless what you're trying to fill it with is eternal, you're still going to want more. Right. That's right. But he says, I inhabit eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, as we talked about yesterday. With him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The only thing that can make us whole is something that is as infinite to connect us with wholeness. Mm -hmm. If we're an irrational number, if we're a fraction, if we're somewhere between where we are in wholeness, we need something that is eternal. Amen? Amen. 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 Roger, if you can help me out a little bit. Young people, I want you to know something. As you get older, there are going to be new things that are going to come into your life that are going to try to persuade you that it is the thing that is big enough to fill that void in your heart. There are people today who are jumping out of relationship to another relationship, from person to person, spending money that they don't have, going into debt, trying to fill an infinite hole that we were created to have. The only thing that these people don't realize, and I want you to know tonight, is that there is only one thing, rather there is only one person that can feel your desire for something more. There's only one person that can actually make you whole. And so the question that Jesus asks you tonight, he asks all of us, is, do you want to be made whole? Yes, I know that your back is bothering you. Yes, I know that you've been having some, some troubles, having peace, you've been depressed. Yes, I know that at school, everyone doesn't like you. But my question is, do you want to be made whole, complete? Do you want me to feel that desire in you 
that only I can feel. If you read the story, brothers and sisters, you will see that immediately. How quick? Immediately. Immediately the man was made whole and he took up his bed and walked. Can you imagine if the man didn't believe that Jesus said he was whole? He didn't say, you know, he told him he was whole. He didn't say rise up and pick him up and throw him out on the street. He didn't do that. He said, rise, take up your bed and walk. So in other words, the man had to act on faith. That's right. He didn't demonstrate it. He didn't say, let me show your legs with this muscle growing. Let me show you how this is going to change. No, no, he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And so he's asking you tonight, look, look, do you want to be made whole? He's able to immediately make you whole. However, you receive it by faith. Do you realize that another person can't complete you? Do you realize that not more stuff, that no more stuff can complete you? God wants you to rise this evening, take up your bed, and walk. Now notice he said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. So now he had, carrying in his hand, a testimony. He had something to show. Look, look, look. This was once something that, uh, that, that was an accomplice for my infirmity. When I was incomplete. When I still wanted more stuff. When I felt like I was needing something else. This is what I had. But now, I am made whole. He wants to make you whole. He wants you to know this at your age now. He doesn't want you to, to stumble upon more things that, that, that are going to promise to make you whole and only to disappoint you yet again. He wants to make you whole this evening. And so if it's your desire, this evening, to in whatever, whatever capacity it may be, accept Christ, his offer to make you whole. Bring it to your mind right now. Bring it to your mind right now. Whether it's emotional, you're incomplete physically, you're incomplete mentally, financially, socially, or you're incomplete spiritually. If it is your desire to be made whole, I'm going to ask you to join me. We're going to have a word of prayer right now. Down at the front. Asking Christ to fill that void inside of us. I'm coming down myself because I realize that there are things that I'm still believing are needed to complete in certain areas. So I'm saying this evening, yes, yes, please make me know. That's your desire.